Hello and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to be talking about how Jesus said goodbye to give us His reconciliation. You know, the disciples of Jesus did not want Him to say goodbye. He got to a point before His death on the cross and His resurrection from the dead that He was going to have to say goodbye. And they picked up on this conversation that this was upcoming and it really bothered their spirit. They didn't understand exactly what he was saying, and so it was going to take years, even after his resurrection, for them to fully understand. But we have their story in the Bible. We want to look at that today. But he had to leave them so that the reconciliation that he wanted to provide for them with their Heavenly Father would occur. Jesus tried to help his disciples understand about his leaving and why it was so important. Today we call it the Farewell Discourse. Now the Farewell Discourse is found in the Gospel of John in chapters 14 through 17. So if you have your Bible, I'd ask you to take your Bible out and look at it with me as we read through some of these scriptures. We can't read them all, but we'll read portions of those chapters so you can get a sense of how Jesus was preparing His disciples and how He prepares us today in the same manner. So this is from the NIV version. Let's begin today in John 14 and verse 1. John 14 and verse 1. He said to them, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. So you see, he lets them know he's going someplace, and he's going someplace to prepare a room for them in a heavenly location. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. See, so don't be discouraged. I, I will come back to you and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Now, whether they did exactly or not, he had to discuss this type of thing with them over many campfires, over three and a half years of doing ministry together. They just so loved his personality and his being with them and catching fish with them and frying it for dinner that night and talking along the dusty roads of Judea, doing ministry and healing people and helping people have hope. They didn't want to lose him, his physical presence. But what they were going to come to understand is that it was going to be knowing him physically to knowing him spiritually, which is much more extensive than just the physical knowing of him. But it's a journey that they had to go through and sometimes we have to go through it as well. So see how Jesus is so concerned for us. He doesn't want to hurt us or make us feel abandoned. It's so critical that we don't feel that he would abandon us at any point in time. So in verse 5, Thomas said to him, Well, Lord, we don't know where you're going. See, he, he just said that they knew. And then he says, we don't know. So how can we know the way? And so Jesus gave this answer in verse 6, I'm the way and the truth and the life. See, keep your focus on me, Thomas. No one knows, or no one comes to the Father except through me. And if you really know me, you will know the Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And he says that with such a surety, and they're saying, huh? How, how do we know that? So Philip said, well, Lord, then show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. See, that's all we needed to know, Jesus. We just needed to know our Father. And we don't know him yet, that Jesus says to him. In verse 9, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? But the truth of that is, is that through what he's going to do in leaving them, dying on the cross, shedding his blood, that sin would be forgiven, being raised from the dead so that we were receiving his spirit resurrected life, well, then we'd be reconciled with our Father. Even though we could see the Father in Jesus, we would then have a personal relationship with our Heavenly Father because He left us for a 
a moment in time to make it possible. In verse 10, don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? Huh, <laughs> I never had thought of it that way, they probably thought. Really? <laughs> These words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but that is the way it was. But that was a really totally spiritual way to look at things, and they didn't look at it totally spiritually. Rather, it is the Father living in me who's doing His work. Believe in me when I say I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves, all the miracles you've seen me do, and you've been involved in yourself. Verse 12, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me, will do the works I have been doing, see, while I've been with you, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. They couldn't imagine doing all the miracles that Jesus had been doing, but he says, you're going to be doing those things, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so remember my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. See, that's what they liked about being with Jesus, you know, in his ministry on the earth. They were with him 24-7, and anything that came to mind, they talked about it or asked him about it, made request of him. You do things for them. But now in the Spirit, they can do the same thing, have 24-7, and even when they're asleep, you see, and we're in, he was asleep before his, a human being. See, there's 24-7 access that they have now. So let's go now down to, to verse 15 because this is where Jesus tells them he doesn't want them to feel like they're being left as orphans. In John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, see, I'll make request to the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you be with you forever. Now this was not Pentecost. This was a special request. Jesus asked his Father to make the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives feel like they were not orphans. So there was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit there that was special because Jesus asked his Father for in a special expression. So he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, in other words, he knew of the Holy Spirit, for he lives with you and was with them in their journeys, and you will, or with you, and he will be in you. He will be in you later on at Pentecost. He will become one who would habitat, you know, have his habitation in our hearts so that Jesus and the Father should also live in us too. In verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. It's a critical statement there. And he doesn't leave us as orphans either in our living. I will come to you. I'm going to have to leave you for a while, but I will come to you to you because you're not an orphan. <clears throat> Before long, in verse 19, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. You will live the abundant life in Jesus. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. So we have a closer relationship than we've ever had before. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. And he does that in relationship with us today, as he did with them in the rest of their lives. <clears throat> so in verse 23 then, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. See, their Father and Son, Jesus, are going to be making their home with us and with them, the disciples then. 
Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. In verse 25, all this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Talk about instant recall. You know, the Holy Spirit's going to help us remember everything Jesus ever said to us. He tells his disciples. And that applies to us today, too. Everything we've read or heard about Jesus, see, the Holy Spirit brings that to our remembrance whenever we need to have him do that. In verse 27, in a very important scripture here, Peace I leave with you. They didn't feel like they had peace, but he was going to leave his peace with them. My peace I give you, his peace, not just peace in general, but his peace, I do not give to you as the world gives. How does the world give their peace? Try to help you feel better for a moment. He helps us feel at peace for always, forever. See, because it comes from the Spirit He is, the eternal Spirit He is, He said, I will not just give you something and take it back. <coughs> it's yours. It's yours to keep. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And of course, that's how they felt. They felt afraid. They felt like the Pharisees were going to kill Him because they said so. And their lives were in jeopardy. That's why they hid in the upper rooms. <laughs> times when stress was happening. They were afraid of the Jews, it says. <clears throat> so in verse 28, you heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. See, you're going to receive much more if I go to my Father, because I'm going to share everything I have with you in the Spirit. You're going to be so much better off knowing that I and the Father are together again because now we're going to deal with you totally in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit who will indwell you, and you will be amazed at what happens. The kind of relationship you're going to have is going to be so much more than what you could have possibly known before. In verse 29, I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Now you know that didn't happen exactly that way in our estimation because they all fled when they, he was being crucified except for John. And so when he was resurrected, they were all hiding out from the Jews. But he wasn't just talking about the immediate right after everything happened. He's talking about as time went on. As they walked down the road, as they actually understood that they were going to have to go to the whole world with this message that they had received from Him. The good news that He had given to us through His death and resurrection and the reconciliation He had given to us with our Heavenly Father. But they would believe. They would come to appreciate it immensely. Go to John 15 now. John 15. In verse 5, John 15, and verse 5, he tells them, I am the vine, you are the branches. So even though I'm going away, I'm still the vine, and you're still the branches, except now we're going to be connected spiritually. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words are, remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. So be connected to Jesus. See, connect, be connected always. Know I'm always with you, even though I say I'm going away, and I am. I'm not really leaving you. I am here for you. This is to my Father's glory, in verse 8, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. <clears throat> and that's very important. We want to be the disciples of Jesus. He, they wanted to remain as the disciples of Jesus. How are they going to do this if you go away? He said, there's a way. He said, I'm the way. 
I'm the truth. I'm the light. Look to me. You will see what I'm saying is true. <clears throat> In verse 9 then of chapter 15, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. And I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. He always ends these comments with joy and peace to comfort them. We say, how can we possibly have joy if you go away? He said, because I won't be gone from you. I'll just be with you in a different way, but a more complete way than you can possibly imagine. See, you'll always have access to me. It won't just be the Apostle John, who seems to be my favorite, you think. It'll be all of you. You all have a complete and total access to me as though you're the only one. Can you believe that? I'm sure they had a problem with that too. <clears throat> so, let's continue on. In verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. In verse 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And here he's laying down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you, and he did. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and he chooses us today, and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, and that's what he wants us to do today in the Spirit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, in the name of Jesus, the Father will give you, this is my command, love each other. That is the command He has given to us, that we love each other as He has loved us. <clears throat> In verse 20 then, chapter 15, Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will persecute you. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. And we find that to be true today, as they found it to be true. For they do not know the one who sent me. That's why Jesus said, Father, may they realize that you have sent me. That was his last words in chapter 17. So here we have Jesus telling us that we will be his. He's bought us with a great price. But he says, even though they persecute you, you've won, because I've won. He won the victory. We won the victory in Jesus. And we just have to realize that and go forward. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. So there the battle goes on, but the victory is Jesus's. And therefore he says, if you believe that in my name, you are the victor as well with me. So rejoice and be glad. We have the victory together. In John 16, <clears throat> John 16 and verse 3, They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. See, it's just the way it is with human beings. <clears throat> so we have to realize we, we've got to have some chances to think this thing through. Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You need the Advocate. We all need the Advocate. See, Pentecost was coming. Hang in there. I'll come back to you for 40 days after my resurrection and then leave you 10 days before Pentecost and you'll go into the upper room and you'll pray, Oh Lord God, send the Holy Spirit to us. And He did. The Holy Spirit came. Jesus sent Him to us. 
and to his original disciples. Let's go down to, down to verse um, 13. 13, John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Can't have a better advocate than that. Lift in on all the secrets that God has for us. He will glorify me because it's from me that he will receive what he will make known to you directly from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So be encouraged. You're on the inside loop of, no, of all knowledge and purpose that God has for all of his creation. And you, you're the pinnacle of his creation, the apple of his eye, as we are today. <clears throat> In verse 23, now I want to read on down verse 16 first. Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me, no more, and then a little after a little while you will see me. And at this some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I am going to the Father? And they kept asking, What does he mean by a little while? <laughs> We don't understand what he is saying. See, that's, that's the trouble when you try to explain spiritual things to physical people. They don't quite understand what all that means. <clears throat> so, uh, in um, 19 through 24, I want to read verse 19. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. Amen to that. Amen to that. So with you now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. How many times has he said this already in this discourse? And he means it too. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. You've not had to. I'm written right there. So now you need to. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Now let's go to John 17 and verse 9. John 17 and verse 9. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. This is a prayer to Jesus' Father. For they are yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine. <clears throat> the glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. So you see how Jesus prays for us today. The name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. Help them, dear Father, to receive this wonderful gift. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so the scripture would be fulfilled. And that was Judas betraying him <clears throat> before the Sanhedrin. So, now in verse 15, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. So in his name we are protected from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. As you send me into the world, I have sent them into the world. We have been sent by Jesus, just as they were in their day. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified or set apart 
for holy purpose that God has in mind for each one of us. Now let's go to verse uh, 20. John 17 and verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. Although it was for them, now he includes all of us today. I pray also for those who will believe me in me through their message, as people today believe in Jesus through our message or our testimony, our testimony about how Jesus has reconciled us to our Heavenly Father, and we testify on His message of giving us that wonderful relationship. In verse 21, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. That is really oneness, and He wants us to be a part of that oneness. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. See how critical that is as far as his message. I have given them the glory that you gave me, in verse 22, that they may be one as we are one, I and them, and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. And so therefore Jesus and the Father live in us, and we live in our Father in Jesus through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Then the world, in verse 20, 23, Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So God loves us the same way that he loves his only son, his only begotten son, Jesus. In verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. So in the Spirit, we are where he is. Ephesians 2, 6, we're right there, right where Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you love me before the creation of the world. And we see his glory through his love being expressed in our lives and in the lives of others that we have contact with. And we say thank you, God, for your glory in, in me and in others that we can show people how much you love us, how much you've always loved your creation. You've never not loved us. Verse 25, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. And that's why he had to go away. So that that kind of relationship could occur. And it occurred. And after his death on the cross and sin was forgiven and his resurrection, resurrection from the dead and his spirit life being shared with us, we were reconciled in personal relationship to our Heavenly Father. And therefore we are his ministers of reconciliation today and we are the ambassadors of his kingdom of light. We can be so thankful that he said, disciples, I gotta go, because I want this to happen for you and all of humankind, that you would all be reconciled to your heavenly Father. And we thank you, dear God, and ask and pray your blessing today, that you'll help us to receive the discourse that you, Jesus, gave to your original disciples and you said, as I go, I want you to be comforted with my peace and to have complete joy in what I am doing in your lives and what you'll be doing in the future as we do this together as one. We ask and pray your blessing to be with us this day and this week. We thank you, dear God, for your love. It's unconditional. You're all inclusive. You bring us into yourself and you even come into us. Oh God, you're so good. You're so loving, you're so kind and merciful, and you comfort us so much. Help us to fully receive it. We thank you and ask your blessing this week that's upcoming, and it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus that we pray, and all together we say, Amen. Amen.